my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Shuai Li, who is visiting us from Lund University, uh, where he's a postdoctoral research fellow in comparative literature. Uh, Shuai Li has recently published his first monograph, Proust, uh, China and Intertextual Engagement. Um, and, uh, it was published last year with Palgrave Macmillan. And before coming to Sweden, Schwangi received his MA in French and English Literature and an MSc in Comparative Literature, as well as his PhD in French at the University of Edinburgh in the UK. He also studied at Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium and was elected as Pensionnaire étranger at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris. So today's talk reflects uh, your current postdoctoral research uh, project on uh, uh, literature and art, the Chinese diaspora in Paris. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much for this introduction. And um, so it's a huge honor for me to be able to uh, present my current research uh, in Sweden. It's actually my first time presenting actual pro proper seminar in Sweden outside um, Lund University. Um, so, the t um, so the talk is entitled uh, A Spiritual Journey Through the Middle Kingdom, Travel and Translation in Klaus Bertrand's um, Translingual Novel. Now, I didn't think that many of you would be uh, terribly familiar with uh, François Bertrand, so I'd like to start uh, with a short introduction of the author, who has nowadays become a towering intellectual figure uh, in France. So Chen was born in China in 1929 and has been living in France since 1948. His double cultural heritage uh, is undoubtedly um, one of his um, most valuable assets for his professional development as a literary translator, French, Chinese, both ways, um, essayist and specialist in Chinese art and philosophy, as well as his vocational engagement as a poet and, uh, novel and novelist of the French language. Cheng is a scholar turned creative writer. His master's dissertation in 1968, which examines classical Chinese poetry of the Tang Dynasty uh, from a structuralist perspective, was already well received by uh, Roland Barthes and uh, Julia Kristeva. In the 1980s, he was actively involved in uh, post structuralist uh, debates, engaging in particular cr uh, cross cultural. Uh, dialogues with uh, Jacques Lacan and Jean Deleuze. So post-structuralist uh, discourses find echoes later in Cheng's creative writings, um, but often with a palpable sense of conceptual reorientation towards uh, Eastern thought, um, as we will see very soon. He turned to fiction uh, in the late 1980s when he was well into his 60s. So this intellectual tra trajectory uh, may well explain his learned, deeply reflective, and retrospective outlook of his novels. More importantly, his intellectual trajectory could help us understand Chen's ultimate artistic ambition to transcend cultures through dialogue. So now, travel and translation, so the first two keywords um, in uh, my title, are frequently seen as metaphors of mobility and flux. Uh, in general terms, travel writing is a translating genre. Uh, Le Di, so the novel, uh, Le Di de Tianyi. Tianyi is the name of the protagonist, um, if you haven't read the novel. Uh, because of the deliberate fictionalization and imaginative reconstruction of the narrative, may not count as a real piece of travel writing in its narrow definition. Ne nevertheless, some of uh, the novel's methods of observation and inquiry are directly uh, informed by uh, established travel literature in both Western and Chinese um, traditions, creating a palpable transcultural intertextual presence. Uh, therefore, I'd like to call them travel motifs. Uh, translation is inherent and at the same time seemingly invisible uh, in the process. As I will demonstrate, uh, issues of uh, travel and tr translation are crucial to our understanding um, of trans translingual aesthetics, which echoes the third keyword uh, in my title, so translingual. 
My initial reading of um, travel motifs in the Di uh, was inspired by the additional Chinese preface Cheng uh, wrote for the Chinese translation of the novel, where the author describes retrospectively the process of, of his literary creation as a spiritual journey in or through the Middle Kingdom, the kind of journey that is shared by all great works of literature from Chinese classics such as Chu Zi and uh, Dream of the Red Chamber to the Western canon such as um, the Divine Comedy, Paradise Lost and Ulysses. Now these works were explicitly mentioned in the preface. Um, so he then regretfully questions if it is still possible for such a spiritual journey to take place on this land of hardship cracked open by turmoil. So that's a quotation. Um, the phrase great works of literature may sound absolutely platonic to us today, but it, but it expresses, uh, as Richard Rorty argues, the hope for a religion of literature and art in Francois Chen's case, uh, in which works of secular imagination replace scripture as the principal source of inspiration and hope for each new generation. By this land of hardship, Chen means not only the planet we all inescapably inhabit, but also more specifically, quote, that self-proclaimed Middle Kingdom. He subtly puns on the historical name of China to suggest uh, to the Chinese readership a time-space for spiritual journeys, or at least for the spiritual journey that has taken place in the novel. Um, the Middle Kingdom here does not imply, as it used to, um, China as the centre of the world, uh, but rather a decentered China. It points to a metaphysical space of relation in which uh, China can dynamically engage with multiple planetary cultural forces, uh, but currently dominated by the West, and where there could be transcendence uh, for all parties. Tra transcendence, again, is um, uh, Francois Chen's own word. So this space is characterized by a kind of essential emptiness, um, yes, um, in between, according to Chen's Taoism infused the conception of the, his term, uh, le vide médian, uh, middle void, or sometimes rendered as um, median void or middle emptiness uh, by different English translators. In a nutshell, Chen conceptualizes the uh, vide médian as a third type of Taoist, qi, so air or breath, or translated into French often as souffle. Um, which has the power of pulling the yin and the yang into positive interaction uh, with a view toward a mutual transformation as beneficial for one as for the other. So this transformative process signals a spiritual exaltation and a form of ceaseless transcendence. As I gradually unfold the various layers um, of travel and translation in the novel, it is crucial to keep in mind, uh, to keep in view uh, Chen's broader intellectual and artistic enterprise of cultural transcendence. So in terms of uh, both structural design and narrative uh, arrangement, um, the notion of journey is fundamental uh, in Chen's conception of Le Di. Uh, depending on the critical angle, so the, not the Le Di can be generically categorized as uh, auto, uh, autofiction, Bildungsroman, Kunstlerroman, uh, romance, historical novel, adventure story, um, travel writing, memoir, and so on. The generic indeterminacy, blurring and blending, or hybridity, brings to the for forefront profound frictional qualities uh, in, the novel in the novelist the fabric of uh, Le Di, between myth and reality, between ethnography and imagination, and between fact, fiction, and reflection. In fact, the generic border crossing itself is um, uh, a literary embodiment of Chen's uh, physical and intellectual journey in life and in fiction, which constantly calls for movements of understanding on the reader's part. Um, so the, the, this, this talk, I propose to um, conc concretely examine a variety of travel motifs, but in three main categories uh, in Chen's translingual novel, and how they function as a consistent uh, structural and thematic frame uh, in which different literary generic qualities and traditions dynamically engage with each other. So drawing on theories of um, cultural translation and um, tr um, 
I additionally argue that these travel motifs ultimately create a liminal space where uh, both European and Chinese literary and artistic traditions are set in motion towards a planetary uh, possibility of cultural transcendence. So I'm going to begin with uh, temporal and spatial movements. Uh, these three categories are very, very often seen in travel writings, uh, seen as the kind of very identifiable traits of travel writing um, in, 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 its, uh, in its tradition. Um, yeah. So to begin with, the tripartite uh, structure of the novel, um, epic of departure, a turn in the road, or miss of return, is already redolent of a Western travel writing tradition going back to Homer's Odyssey. The journey of Tian Yi, the protagonist, spans through much of the turbulent 20th century, roughly from 1925 to um, 1968, just the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, from wartime China, so Sino-Japanese War, Civil War, to uh, post-war France, and back to a radically changed communist China. So significant geographical displacement also take place within China and Europe uh, with different motifs. Both temporal and spatial movements are essential factors behind uh, Tian Yi's physical and psychological growth and spiritual transformation. The narrative of Ledi is firmly rooted in our historical sense of time. And such a precisely stated linear temporal progression is countered by a circular and even pendular movement through space and place which crosses, challenges, and transcends both geographic and cultural borders. Tianyi embarks on a return journey between China and Europe, and his loose bulk of unfinished personal writings are then brought back to France and rearranged by a fictional narrator who has allegedly translated them from Chinese into French and turned them into the book we are now reading. So, Further still, this a fictitious, a kind of pseudo-translation, sometimes known in translation studies, uh, was subsequently translated into Chinese with a new preface uh, signed by the author, as opposed to a, being written by a different uh, fictional narrator, has been overwhelmingly received by the Chinese readership. So in a way, um, the text, both within and outside the narrative, already travels in translation. Um, moving through mountain and water. And this is a very interesting concept. Um, meanwhile, so there are kind of micro-movements uh, in space which are concretized by the human agent's uh, perceptive appreciation of and interaction with natural landscapes, resulting in episodic transformation in the protagonist. Chen's recurrent word-image approach to natural landscapes and phenomena constitutes another significant travel motif uh, in the novel, which is deep-rooted in the classical Chinese traditions of both uh, pictorial art and um, travel writing. The two most celebrated natural landscapes in the novel are mountains and rivers. Indeed, Chen reminds us that in his uh, theoretical writings and um, calligraphic works that mountain and water constitute the Chinese word for landscape, so shan shui, mountain water. Um, just one word, the, the character shui, um, the, the word for water and the word for river actually share, in classical Chinese, actually share the same uh, uh, ideogram. Um, so linked to the Chinese uh, cosmological, um, uh, the cosmological order of yin yang, mountain water embodies the concept of duality which entails the perpetual mutual transformation of the two entities, as Chen cl clarifies in his calligraphic work. I'm basically just trying to translate the passage on the left. Here the two great earthly uh, entities brought together, paired and complementary. The mountain incarnate the principle of yang, and the water the principle of yin. Without relief and difference uh, in altitude, water would not flow. Without the nourishment of water, the mountain would, not, would dry out. The mountain and water are profoundly joined together. So on the same page, um, Cheng also cites Confucius' uh, Confucius saying uh, from the Analects, uh, Lun Yu, uh, the wise delight in water, the humane delight in 
mountains, the wise move, the humane are still, the wise are happy, the humane live long, obviously don't have to believe in this. And, <laughs> and um, so moreover, the, the, the Chinese mountain water is almost always accompanied by mist and or cloud. So in effect, it is the movement of the clouds that animates the mountain and the river and puts them in a dynamic uh, reciprocal relation. Just as the essential middle void, or le vide médian, I mentioned earlier, energizes, energizes the vital breaths so, um, of yin and yang, so souffle vital uh, uh, in French, or qi in Chinese, uh, According to Chen, this visual and symbolic representation of the vital breath as the cloud in mountain water uh, paintings, so landscape paintings, uh, classical Chinese landscape paintings, has fascinated classical Chinese artists and aesthetic theorists for more than a thousand years. To demonstrate this fundamental um, philosophical underpinning of classical Chinese landscape painting, um, Chen has gathered together a rich body of Chinese uh, theoretical uh, writings on pictorial art from the Tang Dynasty to um, the Qing Dynasty and translated them into French uh, in his book Souffle Esprit. That, as always demonstrate as follows, um, these writings leave their marks on Chen's novelistic depiction of um, the landscapes in Le Di, such as the famous Mount uh, Lu passage, so the Lu Shan um, I'd like to show you on the, so this is, here is the handout. Um, so on the handouts, there's absolutely no need to read anything in detail. Uh, I've, what I've done in this handouts, um, uh, the examples, uh, so I have a couple of examples from uh, Souffle Esprit that pinpoint the relationship between mountain, water, cloud, and breath in classical Chinese landscape painting, and then show you the Mount Lu passage from the novel. So I've highlighted some key words and expressions in these passages, which resonate strongly with uh, Cheng's Mount Lu passage. So the Mount Lu passage uh, in the English translation, but due to the, um, I don't have much space on, the, on one slide, this is, it's a very extensive uh, passage. Um, but you can compare very quickly, even in the, with the, in, in the English translation, the kind of a repeated, the kind of, um, uh, without even going into too much detail, the, the lexical similarities and shared conceptual formulations such as the mountain water cloud relation, the quality movement typology of the mist, the cloud. Between the translated theoretical texts and this latter Mount Lu passage may even run the risk of diminishing um, Cheng's literary originality. However, what we can clearly discern in this uh, example is that both linguistic and cultural translations are inherent in Cheng's creative process. In fact, they largely define Chen's translingual aesthetic. So when I say translingual, for me, when I say translingual aesthetic, the, the idea of translation is really fundamental in the way that I see uh, um, translingual, uh, translingualism. So Chen is, to cite Stephen uh, Kalman's uh, translingual uh, work called A Translingual Imagination, um, Chen is uh, one of the remarkable, quote, one of the remarkable number of uh, translinguals who have been active and important as translators, brokers who position themselves between the language of the author and the language of the reader, importantly, as if the, their projects were an extension of their own translingual program. Um, yet, there is a significant um, contextual difference, um, whereas those theoretical texts aim to give technical instructions to artists. The Mount Lu passage is attributed to the intuitive perception of a young protagonist in nature at the moment of artistic initiation, of finding his artistic vocations in the etymological sense of inner calling. So the presence of receptive human agent in the landscape who is inspired, again, inspired in the sense, in the etymological sense of breathing in, um, makes his first attempt to use uh, the magical power and, uh, of brush and ink to establish a relation uh, to, uh, quote, a physical communion, the end of the quote, between nature and man, 
is crucial to our generic acknowledgement of the, novel, of the novel as a Künstlerroman, or novel of artist. So furthermore, in uh, Chen's novelistic depiction, rather than intellectual, it is the sensuous experience of the human agent through the landscape that gives rise to the quality of travel writing in classical Chinese tradition. So to this end, in addition to the, um, the mountain water concept, Cheng introduces another closely related Chinese aesthetic concept, uh, namely sentiment scenery, so qing jing, that explicitly puts man in relation with mountain water. Uh, such a conception in Cheng's words points to the interpretation of human spirit and of the living universe through which all authentic artistic creations uh, take place. The Chinese travel writing scholar James Hargit duly observes that classical Chinese travel literature typically adopts a cinematic word image approach to places, places authors want, to, want readers to see by reading a text. So the, the critics continues, <coughs> In its Chinese context, place refers to a particular environmental setting with identifiable traits, such as a distinguishing name, special topographical features, and or specific historical, cultural, and literary associations. Traditionally, the Chinese attached a great value to such places. Space, on the other hand, is a larger construct, abstract in nature. Imagine a giant tableau onto which is inscribed a cultural construct that includes all places, their unique characteristics and the relationships among them. As travelers move across and through the giant tableau, they perceive both how individual places are unique and how they all ultimately assemble together in some sort of unity. Hargit's um, insightful uh, comment on the spatial configuration in traditional Chinese travel writing describes describes almost exactly the progression of the Mount Lu, the Mount Lu passage, which is the number two in the quotation that I cited earlier in the, in the previous side, uh, slide. So the protagonist arrived and settled at the foot of, the Mount, uh, of Mount Lu with his family. His account of the natural beauty of Mount Lu begins with the proverbial name, mist and clouds of Mount Lu, uh, immortalized by the, ver by the verse of the classical uh, poet Su Shi from the Song Dynasty. It then goes on to elaborate the way the capricious cloud there animates and transforms the various topographical features of the mountain, such as um, countless peaks and hills, the valleys, its fantastic, uh, dangerously towering crags of vegetation, the diffuse evening light, the summit, etc. And the way the cloud, through its different forms, affects the local inhabitants. So the human interaction in landscape. This paradisiacal uh, scenery stimulates the protagonist's imagination of a certain Taoist divinity, or what he calls the Buddha of the West. Now, as I will expound very soon, uh, in ancient China, the West actually refers to um, today's India. Um, but then the other West will come back to us very soon, at two. Finally, Tianyi understands this giant tableau where everything is changing and nothing is fixed in the light of the Taoist cosmogony. That's the last sentence of that quotation, that, or that uh, passage is, all living things are but conden condensation of the breath. So that ultimate unity that is found uh, in this, um, piece of this traveling uh, writing passage. So to reaffirm the distinctive quality of travel writing in Le Di, I've included in the handouts, um, on the handout, a passage from a real 17th century uh, travelogue uh, on Yellow Mountain by um, sometimes called the China's, known as China's the greatest uh, travel writer, Xu Xiaqe, and for comparative purposes. So if you see, read that, pa I mean, we're not going to discuss that passage here, but then I think the idea is that if you see, read that passage and uh, compare that passage to the Mount Lu passage, you immediately see the kind of um, lexical conceptual similarities why i would say that whether even if the text is written in the french text is in, written in the french language but in fact it's, it has a very trans impalpable yet invisible transcultural presence beneath that text 
Um, but unfortunately, I didn't quite manage to find the have gained access to the French tra translation of uh, Xu Jacques's passage. So in the handouts, I think I only include the Chinese original one and the um, an English translation. It is worth mentioning that apart from uh, Mount Wu passage, Tianyi, so so much for the mountains. Now here, there's, here's the rivers. Um, Tianyi's travel itinerary and wandering destiny. <coughs> as well as his intellectual and artistic development are strongly identified with a number of well-known rivers from the Yangtze River, which fostered uh, Taoism to the Yellow River uh, that cradled Confucianism uh, from uh, the Seine, um, which embraces and protects the cultural heart of France and, and to the um, La Loire, um, and the list goes on and on. The protagonist des describes himself as the child of the river. <coughs> he compares his life journey to the water in the river. It evaporates, uh, turns into clouds, and falls as rain back to the source of the river, like, quote, the circulating breath at the great return. Uh, we have gone from river to river to this last river. The loop of destiny ends here, of that we are certain. What I've shown here, this is uh, again from uh, Cheng's calligraphic work, not from the novel itself. Um, uh, but I'd like to use it to illustrate and highlight the um, visual quality and, um, in Cheng's literary aesthetic. So it's a kind of an intertextual reading among Cheng's texts. Um, um, the cross-cultural and spiritual significance is thus conferred on Tianyi's geographical and, topo and topographical displa uh, displacement. Uh, in fact, the Cheng first intended to employ um, La Ba, le fleuve, so there, the river, as the title of the novel. But um, it was rejected by the editor, by the French editor, due to its lack of a literary resonance in the kind of French, um, for the kind of French imagination. Um, if the mountain, lofty, rock solid, unchanging, finite, embodies the Yang principle, Cheng expatiates on water, river, the yin par excellence to express the infinite in the finite, uh, the incomplete, um, the incomplete in the complete. So this should add to our understanding of Chen's spiritual journey, a journey that is far beyond the human individual's growth and transformation. In this respect, the river for Chen is readily comparable to the sea for uh, Virginia Woolf or Joseph Conrad or even more so for uh, Nietzsche. The river landscape in Cheng that becomes the staging of theory. Establishing a cross-cultural network, a model of comparison which stimulates movements of understanding and mediation. It is on the Yangtze River, just before he leaves um, for France, that Tianyi listens to a certain professor, F. Um, explain the river as a symbol of time in the Taoist tradition. We sail through the native region of our beloved Laozi, the founder of Taoism. As we know, uh, he's the, found oh, just <laughs> the founder of Taoism, enter the middle voice, inherent in the way, uh, breaths themselves, they impart to the way um, its rhythm, its respiration. Most important, they allow it to effect the mutation of things and to return to the origin, the very source of the primal breath. For the river, the middle voids take the form of clouds. The river, with its origin in the way, takes its appropriate, pl uh, takes, uh, its appropriate place in earthly order as well as in the heavenly. Water evaporates from the river, condenses into cloud, falls back into the river as rain, feeding it. So this teaching later inspires the protagonist to creatively apply a Taoist reading of Proust's fluid conception of time. Uh, there's no need to go into this passage in detail, but uh, I'd just like to say that the, uh, the, for the published book, <laughs> there's a considerable uh, part of the book was, was, was about François Chen, is comparing and contrasting uh, François Chen and the Proust, and this was really my starting point. So when Chen started to talk, to talk about in such, of lo, in such of Time to Come, make re reference to Deleuze, uh, Avenir, Devenir, and, and, and then the kind of very post-structural discourse on 
difference, uh, difference uh, the differing and differing, and, and then suddenly go back to the kind of very Chinese Taoist discourse um, from the book of uh, mutations, uh, changes from the void and exchange, and uh, from the some known in Chinese as I Ching, so the book of changes from sometimes. So similarly, before uh, deciding um, to uh, return to China, Tian Yi spent his last days visiting La Loire, the, you know, the French river, with Véronique, retracing its source. The protagonist thinks of his childhood experience of discovering the Yangtze River with his father. The man in exile who contemplated a vast landscape, was he not the child of Asia who had gazed upon... He was talking about the protagonist, the Tian Yi was talking about himself. Um, was he not the child of Asia who had gazed upon the river Yangtze with his father and who had gone up other rivers to other sources? Then and now, it was the same discovery. A long, wide river begins as a tiny trickle of water buried under impenetrable grass. So he's making his um, analogies based on geographical rivers, the, the river landscape. Um, Surrounded by a foreign landscape, now we're in La Loire in France, Tian Yi seems to become ever more conscious of his revised theoretical position. Up river to the source, would it be the beginning of a new life or the end of another? That time is cyclical and that each new cycle brings changes, both foreseen and unexpected was a known thing, an integral part of my vision and I no longer doubted its validity. So cyclic vision was referring to the Taoist vision of time. In this foreign country, now a new person, by an act of will, couldn't I cut the roots of the past, untie the most inextricable knots, cut the roots? Maybe, since man is merely a creature gliding over the surface of the earth, an animal, the culture hands a few tried and true ways. Is he really so deeply rooted that he can't imagine being transplanted. The Taoist cyclical vision of river as time still holds true for Tian Yi. However, a new theoretical issue of root, as in um, la hut, as in the, the way, the, and root as in the stem, so la racine, is raised in this uh, foreign land. So this, this is what I mean by revise a, theoret a theoretical position in a, in a, in a foreign landscape. That's to echo the German scholar uh, Ottmar Etter's uh, remark. The theory of the landscape turns into a landscape of theory. So now I'm moving on to the final part of the um, kind of travel motif, category of uh, travel motifs, uh, which is called a quest for knowledge and love. This is again um, from Chen's calligraphic work, um, the character uh, for the quest for those uh, sonologists and uh, who understand who know how to read the Chinese uh, ideograms, I think you can probably we can come back to this in the, at a later at a later um, when we are question answer session. You can see that the the way that the character quest has evolved is actually very different from the from the Cheng's uh, calligraphic work here, and he is visibly informed by kind of Taoist vision that his conviction that, that he he has. Uh, I think any, I think it'd be fair to say that if you don't ha if you don't know the title, you would, nobody would be able to uh, decipher which character this is a this actually is. <laughs> um, so that's interesting. So the cal cal calligraphy is in in Cheng's work is more than just a representation of a copying of a character. It actually has its own um, way of uh, you know, the, the fashioning um, in Cheng's vision. Tian Yi does not, of course, move through mountains and waters simply, simply, through, um, mount, uh, simply out of aesthetic pleasure or theoretical reflection. Uh, his cross-cultural return journey is indelibly marked by the notion of quest. While Tian Yi's departure for Europe under a governmental study grant uh, can be perceived as a quest for knowledge, uh, his resolute return to a much altered, dangerous China to join his loved ones, practically, um, uh, practically declining a romantic invitation to stay in Europe, is reminiscent of Odysseus' of the, um, Odysseus's, uh, homecoming quest for uh, Penelope uh, in Ithaca after 20 years away. The title of the final part of the novel, Myths of Return, um, seems to encourage such a reading. 
the, but the myth here um, can also be understood in a vulgar sense of um, describing something that did not happen uh, in, in reality or, or is untrue, since the author himself did not actually return to China. And um, um, the quest for the so-called Western knowledge uh, is a key two-fold travel motif in the novel, which puts cross-cultural history in dialogue with the present. Now, what do I mean by that? Before Tian embarks on the journey to, to Europe, he was sent by his Buddhist Chan master to work briefly at the uh, Dunhuang Caves, uh, a Buddhist archaeological site um, which can be traced back to the 4th century um, and it was rediscovered in the 20th century uh, by introducing Dunhuang to the narrative Cheng naturally invokes the topos of uh, the Silk Road. In ancient China, the West is generally reused, as I said, to refer to today's India. It is by this road that Buddhism was first indirectly uh, transmitted from India to China. And for centuries, Bo uh, Chinese Buddhist monks made pilgrimages along the Silk Road to the so-called Western region, so the Xiyu. Uh, in order to obtain sacred Buddhist scriptures. Tianyi describes the prosperous city of Dunhuang as a place of exchange between China and the outside world, as well as a stop for Buddhist pilgrims. Now, one, of the, one of the best known uh, pilgrim monks is called Xuanzang from the early Tang Dynasty. And his legendary travel uh, to India in the seventh century um, in search of Buddhist knowledge is a milestone in Chinese religious history. Uh, after his return to China, he, he devoted himself entirely to translation of Buddhist texts directly from Sanskrit to Chinese. He organized a sophisticated large-scale translation forum, so Yi Chang, for collaborations and significantly advanced the contemporaneous Chinese translation theories, so notably from the dominant literal translation of the time to simple or wen style. The trans-historical comparison between Xuanzang and um, Tianyi, and by extension, Cheng, becomes all the more compelling if we remind ourselves of uh, Cheng's other career as a literary translator of ancient Tang poetry from Chinese to French, and of Baudelaire, Hanbu, Apollinaire, and Michaud from French to Chinese. So, so the Chan master explicitly draws Tianyi's attention to, uh, the, um, attention to the analogy between China's profoundly consequential encounter with Indian thought and art centuries before and that between China and the West today. Didn't our masters of the 8th century, of the 8th through the 7, 11th centuries assimilate Indian art? Because they were steeped in their own living tradition they could absorb outside influences without renouncing their own world. The more familiar they were with the finest in their own tradition, the more easily they recognized the finest in another. I'm telling you this because you, you will have to face what is different. Once this war is over, I think it's inevitable for China and the West to encounter each other on a deeper level, especially since the West is so free and so receptive to outside influences, even Asian. Now, I think it sounded better in the French original text. It sounds a bit naive in the English translation. And, uh, um, but anyway, that's the, that was the English translation I used. And um, so in studying the turbulent migrant and transcultural experience of uh, Jean Christophe from Roman Hollande's eponymous, uh, eponymous a Bildungsroman, Tianyi himself becomes aware of the exigences of ongoing dialogues for intercultural uh, transformation. With all its traumatic events, the tumultuous history of Jean Christophe seeking fulfillment through three cultures, German, French, and Italian, inspired every one of us at a time when we too aspire to metamorphosis. We knew that after its long dialogue with India and Islam, Chinese culture had reached a point where the West was an essential voice and could not uh, be ignored. Um, so the, I think the, just one word that we don't really see in the English translation is that Chang, uh, is Francois Chang's play of words with, of la voix and la voix as in the translation for Taoism. So the Taoism, uh, the Tao in French is translated as la voix. So he plays a lot with that. Uh, the, the, this uh, play of words. Uh, 
Yes. However, the kind of spiritual knowledge which defines Tianyi's quest uh, is not Buddhism or any particular theological inquiry per se. Uh, Chen's true religion is art. Uh, in this respect, Chen's approach is very much Proustian. A fundamental epistemic contribution of Tianyi's cross-cultural journey is the consistent construction of cultural and artistic parallels and equivalents that bridges our understanding and, appreci and appreciation of both Western and Eastern cultural heritages. The discussion of protagonists of the protagonists' learning uh, about one particular artistic medium, painting, calligraphy, uh, literature, theater, or music, is typically provoked by an encounter with something epistemically new in one culture, then compared and contrasted with what the protagonist already knows about that medium in another culture. The respective theory and, and historical development are then fleshed out. The actualization, cross-cultural, um, cross-fertilization and blending um, of and the constant renegotiation uh, between two uh, different cultural traditions result in a kind of transcultural intermedial aesthetic epitomized by the novel itself. Chen firmly believes in the primacy of uh, the arts in spiritual life and he understands that the highest and most sacred achievement of art as creating dialogue. Dialogues between cultures, art and nature, self and other, aiming at transcendence and universal harmony. So again, dialogue, transcendence, these are Chen's own words. Um, uh, if time and movement are crucial to the protagonist's physical... Uh, is that, is that, shall we? <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. If time and movement are crucial to the protagonist's physical and psychological growth, cross-cultural exposure and contact, as well as intellectual and artistic training, signal mo moments of a transformative ep epiphany, which profoundly shaped Tianyi's and by extension Chen's migrant identity. Highlighting this, his liminal disposition uh, with regard to cultures, there is a clear parallel between the physical and the inner in Tianyi's um, uh, journey. The departing quest for Western knowledge is complemented by a return uh, quest for love. Whereas Tianyi's journey to the West conveys a clear sense of a geographical destination, his home returning uh, is portrayed paradoxically as a myth-infused, downward, meandering, and seemingly perpetual journey of a transient nature. To be reunited with his loved ones is to be home. The return to, again, to the root, as in the stem, effectively becomes the continuation of another root, as in the way, in China, after his return. Um, as in mythology, where, to quote uh, North, uh, Northrop Frye, uh, our world has always been a middle earth, uh, with different forms of experience above and below it. Uh, Tianyi's return journey shows a palpable sense of vertical movement, echoing the myth of Orpheus and that of Dante. Tianyi returns to China uh, after um, La Monte, uh, which is the lovers, the female protagonists, after her calling, quote, return, here you are at last, here we are at last, only to find out, like Orpheus, looking back at, at, at Eurydice, near the threshold of the underworld, that La Monte is lost forever. Instead, he learns of the survival of uh, Lamy, so Tianyi's um, male companion, uh, and describes the undertake, uh, um, and, and decides to undertake another journey to join Lamy from the south to the great northern wilderness of China, so known in China, Chinese as Beida Huang. At the beginning of the final part, Tianyi remarks, to rejoin uh, the lover, so Lamont, I know that returning to an altered, unrecognizable China will be a veritable descent into hell. Towards the end, after rejoining uh, La Min, Tianyi says, I am accompanying my friend on his journey through hell. So like Dante's Virgil, uh, like Dante in Virgil's company through the nine circles of hell. So resonating again with uh, Orpheus's returning of passion to boys after his um, eventual failure to retrieve uh, Eurydice, Tianyi's reunion with uh, La Min quickly develops into a kind of a homoerotic uh, companionship. Um, the myth of Orpheus is, um, 
the myth of Orpheus is explicitly compared. So the, the, it's Cheng himself, actually, who evokes this um, comparison in, his, um, in the novel and in his other interviews and um, theoretical writings. The myth of Orpheus is explicitly compared to the Buddhist legend of uh, Mu Lian, uh, known in Chinese as Mu Lian Jiu Wu. So the, as Tian Yi remarks, just as when my mother died, I think of the Buddhist legend of Mu Lian in hell. Mixed into it now is a European legend, that of Orpheus. End of the quote. Tian Yi learns about this legend from the wall painting at the previously mentioned archaeological site of Dunhuang. It recounts how the devout Buddhist Mu Lian uh, descended to the underworld, facing a thousand trials, and to free his deceased mother's soul. This legend is generally uh, suspected to have a certain Indian origin, um, but there is not yet any concrete evidence. The Buddhist story of uh, Tsitikapha, one of the four principal bodhisattvas in Mahayana Buddhism, um, so known in Chinese as the Dizang Wang, in, um, uh, is also depicted actually in Dongfang. Um, so this is actually a fact. Um, the apparent and in many ways surprising emphasis on filial piety in this Chinese version of, le of the Buddhist legend of uh, Mu Lian um, is in all likelihood due to the influence of Confucianism in China. Uh, it can already be regarded as a sinicized uh, version of the original myth, uh, but we can't verify that now. <laughs> That are, according to our current understanding anyway. Um, so we haven't found the, the, the actual myth, the, uh, the mythical origin of this tale. An example of cultural translation amalgamation between ancient India and China. Therefore, in comparing the myths of Mulian and, or and Orpheus, Cheng again subtly draws this analogy between China's two historical encounters with the West. So two Wests. Cheng's fascination with myths in his comparatist approach to cultures may be best explained in Tianyi's following words. Since my stay in Dunhuang and my visit to uh, Campo Santo of Pisa, again, we see this kind of parallel and equivalence here, where I saw the frescoes of the master of death, I have come to believe that only a mythic vision allows mankind to assume control of what cannot be fully verbalized. Who among us can claim to take the measure of real life, to know how deep it sinks its roots how far it extends its branches. Again, this, fast, this, this kind of central obsession almost with roots and root and is, is almost in manifest in, in, in all levels. So now I'm kind of close to the um, um, conclusion um, of this talk. Uh, historical progression, geographical displacement, uh, land, uh, landscape appreciation, cross-cultural encounter, personal quests, artistic pilgrimage, and trans-historical analogy these are essential, essential components of Tian Yi's, and to some extent, the author's journey, inner and outer, in space and in time. They constitute the most recurrent and important travel motifs in a novel, each establishing a layer of structure, so to speak. Um, so and I'll now um, address some uh, theor theoretical issues. Um, the relationship between travel and translation is brought to prominence in terms of translingual creative practice. Now, in the D, this relationship is made all the more compelling that the, um, the novel fictionally stages um, a sophisticated theory of such a dynamic relationship. Chen's fictional exploration of the notion of translation goes far deeper than the sometimes generalized, loose, and metaphorical application of the term translation. I have extensively quoted um, Cheng's work of translation from classical Chinese to modern French and to demonstrate the author's sensitivity to bilingual textuality um, and the um, bicultural uh, reality in his novelistic fabric, which entails a heightened self-reflexivity. So when I, when I, what I mean by self-reflexivity here is that that's actually I'm making, making reference to this kind of intertextual reading across his works and... Um, Ledi is not an ordinary traveller's tale about, foreign, about the foreign land told in his or her mother tongue, a native tongue. It is a, a, a mise en scène of a, migrant, of a migrant's liminal self-positioning between two cultures through languages. Tian Yi is not simply a traveller who constantly crosses national borders. Rather, he is 
like Cheng, a, a, a cultural passeur, so a ferryman or a commuter who linguistically translates, epistemically transforms, and spiritually transcends his own individual experience of. Now, I'm going to use the word migrance. I've used the French formulation because I think so far this is the best I can find that summarizes everything I wanted to say about migration. So, à la fois migration et errance, souvent souffrance, mais au bout du compte, renaissance, dans la jouissance. So, um, so at this ideal of ultimate uh, renaissance and jouissance, um, through, through his uh, translingual creative practice, are all pervasive in Cheng's uh, inaugural address at the L'Académie Française. Um, the liminality of migrant experience, the migrant culture of the in-between, the space of translation of cultural difference at the interstices, now these are of course, defining features or de defining characteristics, uh, characteristics of Omi Babaha's influential formulation of um, cultural translation beyond uh, strict linguistic medium. Critics of Babaha's concept of cultural translation, which employs um, Babaha uh, in the article actually um, employs uh, Sam Rushdie's uh, Satanic Verses as a prime example, uh, voice serious reservations about calling it translation as it does not involve two texts, or even one text, and certainly not more than one language. So, in what, so the critics of Babaha sometimes criticize that this is, in fact, not translation at all. Um, in this respect, uh, Cheng's version of cultural translation, I think, um, a kind of theory as fiction quite rightly addresses the critical problem by attending to both the metaphorical and the linguistic notions of translation. And indeed, other than the number of Chinese texts that have been identified as the sources of Cheng's linguistic and cultural translation, critics have also uh, duly observed how this translation process has visibly affected Cheng's creative use of the French language, creating a stylistic uh, unique to Franco-Chinese writers. Now, I'm not really going into details with that point because that requires a quite extensive illustration of actually what happens in Cheng's um, French language, and uh, especially that not everyone is actually Francophone here in, in, in the audience. Um, but that has been observed by even has already been uh, observed by critics. Perhaps even more significantly, uh, while fictionally putting travel and translation in a multifarious uh, uh, relation, Cheng also assumes a certain ethical responsibility for cultural representations, which is why the self -consciously, he self-consciously adopts a comparatist uh, approach to even the smallest cultural details, uh, makes cross-cultural analogies, and creates. A liminal space, um, a liminal spaces um, in which differences and power relations can be constantly renegotiated. So for Cheng, uh, in between this liminality and interstitiality seems to be the sine qua non condition, uh, a sine qua non of cultural transcendence through exchange. As he um, asserts elsewhere, true transcendence paradoxically is located in the between in that which bursts forth most intensely when decisive exchange between beings and being takes place. Um, travel and translation produce narratives across borders, but the travel motifs and the idea and practice of translation in the deed do not in fact presuppose or posit a journey, be it metaphorical or literal, from A to B. Rather, they aim at a linguistic and cultural reorientation of both A and B towards a C. Uh, that is always in the process of becoming, so in French, the avenir, uh, to come, or dans le différé, as I cited earlier, so deferring or differing. Indeed, Chen's configuration of self and other in relation to the idea of transcendence is recognizably in line with um, the, um, other, uh, with the um, other well-established post-structuralist um, thinkers, um, thinkers' works from Derrida's deconstructive uh, openness for new meanings uh, to the ethical ac acceptance and negotiation of one's own boundaries with the other in Luce Irigri's uh, formulation of horizontal transcendence. And, um, and, also, and finally, to uh, Gayatri Spivak's theory of planetarity, uh, which points to a strong sense of alterity, uh, a kind of fundamental intention towards the other. So in sum, what we can see in Cheng's uh, Le Di are both an embodiment and an allegory of travel and translation, 
which signal fundamental human interaction that inspires informed imagination and provokes lateral thinking about cultural representations, simultaneously engendering something new and recreating something old uh, for a planetary possibility of um, cultural transcendence. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay.